Today's webinar session has been sponsored by Ingot Africa Limited. We'll be discussing stocks, we'll be discussing fundamental analysis, and our guest speaker is Frederick Sports. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, how's it going? Good, good. Morning for you, afternoon, evening for me, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's very early here. Yeah, it's good to have you back on the lounge in a long, long time. Yeah, it's been like a year, longer than a year, right? Yeah. How have you been? Very good. I can't complain. Just kind of busy. All right. How's all, it right. Going? How? Oh. all good as well on this side. Um yeah, so I think to, I think we'll actually just have like uh just an open-ended conversation basically on fundamental analysis for macro traders, long-term stock um traders. Um is it possible to have you on video so we can see you? Yeah, one. Yeah. One second. All right. Okay. Yeah. How does that look? That's better. Right. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's webinar session. We're honored and privileged to have Frederick Scott. He's our monthly contributor and he's a specialist on fundamental analysis, all things stocks trading and portfolio management. He's worked as a hedge fund manager before. Um so Scott, I think as we start off, maybe you can just tell us, you know, for macro traders and especially people who trade with a long-term perspective, the role that fundamental analysis, you know, plays when it comes to execution, especially on stocks trading. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I, I believe that there is, it's really, really difficult to, um, invest using fundamental analysis in a short-term basis. It would be a specific type of investing, more event-driven. So for example, um, if you're investing in a pharmaceutical company that is going to release a new uh, medication of some kind, then there is one specific event that you're investing for, and it's based on fundamental analysis, meaning like the, the medical trials, um, what's going on with the with the phase one, phase two, phase three? Did, is it going well? Uh, if it is going well, you can you know that information is accessible and you can find out. And but mainly you're guessing, you're thinking like, okay, if this medication is going really well, uh, the trial for phase three was really good, then the odds of it getting approved by the FDA are very high. So you can have a certain degree of confidence that it will work out. That is a type of fundamental analysis investing in the sense of like you are investing in that real event. You are looking at a company's uh, balance sheet per se. You're making sure that they have the money to get the medication through. Through you have uh, that they have enough capital to uh, launch it. Or sometimes, with, which is what happens most of the time, they get acquired by law. Is one way to invest fundamental analysis term yeah is the it, long time it's been all the studies that i've looked up and the research that i've done it's mainly the best case scenario for fundamental analysis if you're going to make a an argument between that and technicals so technicals i believe um are more short-term driven with long-term patterns or or long-term uh cycles sorry so fundamentals are definitely more long-term in the sense of like you can see a company's performance over time and you project out let's say four or five years what it would be and you can have a pretty certain de um, degree of confidence where you, that, that it's going to be okay so for example um tesla is a company everybody knows so that um, they come out with a report the report says we're making a million cars this year so you can look at the balance sheet. You can look at how much capital they have. You can look at like the market share that they have today, and you can make a pretty good guess 
about what the future will be. So a lot of and uh, a lot of analysts believe that margins will probably come down to somewhere like fifteen percent over time, and um, sales will stabilize to more like what a regular car company looks like, which would be something like GM or Ford. So they have slower growth. They sell a huge number of cars, but there's not much market share to be gained after you hit a certain number. So you can project out in year one, as I will sell a million and a half cars. In year two, we will sell a million, 750,000 and so on and so forth. You can set a rate of growth and then you can have an expectation of what the stock would do during that time. Or not a necessarily what the stock would do but what you're willing to accept so i believe that technicals are more based on what the price is and what 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 um, the historical trends have told you about what the price does fundamental analysis is more of like your personal um ability to understand okay if i'm overpaying or underpaying for something so if you do your model of Tesla and you realize that the company's worth maybe $250 a share and you check your stock price and it says $290 a share. I'm not sure what it is today, but let's just say it says that. Then you're like, well, you would be overpaying what the price that you have set for it. So once it falls below that price, which eventually it will, um, then, or sometimes it doesn't, and you have to accept that too. But if it falls below that price, then you're more confident to buy it because you know, okay, it's worth 250. If it fell at 220 for reasons unknown, for say it could be interest rates, it could be just market dynamics, it could be uh, many, many re- stock prices go down for all kinds of reasons that have very little to do with the company. So if if the stock price falls below your target price, then it's pretty easy for you to say, I can buy it now because it's below the price that I believe is called fair value. So that plays out much better over time. It's very difficult to have any degree of confidence in a short-term basis if you're using that type of analysis, like um, like a discounted cash flow model or something like that. I don't believe there's any usefulness using a DCF model in less than a five-year period. That when you look at the studies that have been done on this, the rate of accuracy greatly diminishes the the shorter term it it gets. All right, and so like when you're back dating and as when you're evaluating the financial health of a company, for example, as you said, so how far back do you go when you okay you mentioned five years. So the question would be like for people who would be looking to make their investments or if they're traders and or speculators uh, looking at specific individual types of stocks what should they look for in the financial statements is it cash flow is it revenue growth is it um you know turnover what 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 kind of things should they look out for on 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 the statements on the financial statements well um I believe that I had written an article on this and and that's probably where you're getting the question from, but I can't recall exactly what the study was, but the study did, uh, uh, they were basically checking to see which measures of of, uh, qualitative um, information is useful when it comes to like uh, determining if a company is viable or not. So I believe that the most important one was cash flow and over time you can see um and it makes sense because example would be lemonade stand somebody selling lemonade cost which is the cup the straw lemons the water and your time so the, and the labor so those are your costs now if you sell the lemonade for $1.50 and your costs are 75 cents, then you're making a 50% margin, which is really good, right? That's why it's like, okay, yeah, that's a great business. 
most of the time you're expecting somewhere around 20% or 15%, depending on what industry you're in. But in software, for example, it would be like 50, 70%. That's normal. But in this lemonade stand, in this hypothetical example, let's just say it's 50%. Then your cash flow, after you pay all expenses, everything you paid, you, you paid, you paid for all the cups, you paid for the straws, you paid for the lemons, the water, your labor, and you pay yourself some money. After you're done with everything, and then let's say you use a little bit for marketing or whatever to make like a sign. So after you pay for everything, it everything costs you let's say 90 cents with um capital expenses plus whatever um supplies you need for your lemonade stand. So you end up with 60 cents out of every lemonade sold. With that, um you can consider that your cash flow. Now, if you look, if somebody wants to buy your lemonade stand from you, how would they know you're any good at selling lemonade? They would know that not by how many lemonades you sell. Because you, you could be selling tons of lemonade and make no money or lose money. But in this case, you have managed your costs very well. You have everything under control. You have a good supplier. All these things are set up they all kind of take care of themselves if you focus on the cash flow. So if you see like in year one, for example, you were making 60 cents per every lemonade you sold was free cash flow. Then in year two, you found a way to grow your own lemons. So now the, the cost of lemons went down. So now your margin went from 50% to 60%. So now in year two, you could say, I'm expecting 70 cents of free cash flow. On year three, um, you figure out that um, plastic the price of plastic went down, so cups are cheaper. So then you can say, okay, now I'm making seventy five. When you see it. And you see that cash of that company. Fortunately, fundamental analysis is heavily influenced by accounting. And, and um, things per share can be manufactured by lowering the shares out that makes less shares available for the public, which makes the price of the earnings higher. Um, that's always been argued but i think now we can reasonably say that that's what happens so um earnings could look better than what they actually uh revenue could be very good but you could be making no money on your revenue which is why it would be reflected on cash flow so if you set Nates that year, but you lost money because maybe you have invested a lot of. Be aggressive. You want to reinvest every single penny that I make into growing revenue. But after some point, they need cash flow. And that's when it becomes some things. It doesn't have to raise money. It doesn't have to put out bonds or it doesn't have to sell more shares, which dilutes you as an investor. So if you're looking at fundamental analysis to investing things like this, I think the best form of, I guess the best measure would be cash flow, I believe. Okay. Um, sorry for the internet lag. There's a bit of internet lag, but I hope you can hear me. Um, and then, I can, yeah. yeah, okay, cool. 
Um, when companies are starting up, uh, case in point, Amazon, you tend to find that they strive more for market share and market dominance vis-a-vis -vis profitability. Um, so at the early stages of startups, for example, before they become really big as what now the case for Amazon is like, for speculators and even investors alike mm -hmm. for stocks, what should they look out for? Uh, when it comes to startups or is it something that they should like give it some time as a wait and see or do people just overlook small companies that do have some potential to grow uh, in a couple of years what would be your advice on that um well that's kind of what everybody wants they want to find the next amazon so i feel like it's okay to take a chance and something like that, but you have to understand a few things. One of them is you have no way to know whether this is going to work out or not. I think you can do as much research as you can, as you want. You can talk to industry leaders. You can understand the market they're going after. And that helps you feel a little safer. But in reality, there is no guarantee whether or not they're going to stay in business because a lot of young companies go default. So um, I believe that if you're trying to invest in the next Amazon or something like that, the number one thing you have to look for is revenue and, like you said, market share. So if every year... Um, the market share is growing in every year the revenue is growing and uh, as a young company it has to reinvest every penny it makes so I'm not expecting any cash flow at all I'm not expecting any earnings at all I'm not expecting a dividend I'm not expecting anything like that so I'm looking at is the revenue growing at a higher rate than the industry standard? For example, if you're Amazon, you Amazon started as retailer, it's not that anymore, but it started as that. And the market, I believe the rate growth for the retail market was something like 8% or 10% at the time, which was in the 90s. It was actually pretty much higher than it is today because um, e-commerce wasn't as big. Mm -hmm. So I think Sears was the biggest company at the time when it came to retail. So they were growing somewhere around there. Amazon could not. Like if you were... Hello? Yeah, sorry about that. It tripped a bit. Um, but we're back on. Okay. Can you hear me? Hello. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is the first time the internet is misbehaving on us. Um, oh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. So we were discussing the case in point for startups and the um, strive for market market dominance and market share vis-a-vis -vis profits at the yeah. very stages. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you should worry so much about that. And also, like, a lot of it is risk management. Like, for example, if you're... In, don't put all your money in to the next Amazon, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is maybe set out 10%, 15%. I wouldn't go higher than that. Maybe 20% if you're young. If you're, if you're a younger person, you can take higher risk. So you can you can do something like 20% of all your money can be invested into this one thing that you really believe in. You let, Let's say um, you want to invest in a young car company like Rivian or something like that. You're like, oh yeah, like, they're going to be the next big thing. They have all these contracts. It's going well. So you can put 10, 15, 20% of your money in something like that. But 
I think the mistake people make is that they sell too early or they buy too late. They buy when it's like in the news and everybody's talking about it. I feel like that's already too late. Or they sell when the stock goes down because of whatever reason. They panic, sell, and then, you know, they're out of the stock. But if you're investing in a company like that, two things. Worry about the revenue, worry about the market share. But the second, worry about the management team. And if the it's very important for a company like that to have a good CEO, a good management team. If you hear any scandals, accounting scandals, get out, like immediately. If you hear like, oh, maybe they didn't report their earnings correctly or they reinstated certain numbers, that's to me, I'm out. Like, I don't even have to ask questions. And then um, you really have to make the, maybe do some digging, find out, do the employers like their managers? Do they like working at that company? Because you need passion to work in a company like that. So one thing that Amazon employees and maybe Google and employees and Facebook and Tesla employees, all of these employees have in common is that they all love working where they work. So maybe you can find that out in something like Glassdoor or something like that, where you can read comments from workers that work in that company. And you can see like, oh, um, these people like working here. So that's a good sign. If they don't, that's often a sign of bad management, often a sign of erratic behavior like kind of like what happened with workday the real estate company there was a lot of crazy stuff going on people were coming in and out all the time you could have you not saying you could have seen it coming but you could have seen it coming you could have seen that employees were not happy you could have seen that the ceo was throwing parties every day like these are things you could have found out before you put a bunch of money into something like that all right. All right. And now let's 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 switch a little bit to central banks and the Fed and the control that they do have on economies and and political spaces, which eventually do affect stock prices. So especially when it comes to the the G8 countries and their central banks. Um, so what roles do, especially now that um, uh, we're in almost, I think we're still in the earnings season. Um, when a report comes out from maybe the Fed or, or ECB, um, is it too late for people to execute on, um, on a long-term view? Or, you know, when it comes to execution for traders, retail, and also investors on, on stocks, those who speculate on stocks, when reports do come out, do they do do they have an impact on their on their individual trading, or is it by the time the news is being released, the, the trend has already happened? What is the case scenario for long term stock traders? Uh, I believe that that's why I, I in, at first I said you have to figure out what price you want to pay for something. I believe you should do that always first. So if you decide to pay X amount of dollars for whatever company and the Fed comes out with a report that's maybe they're saying, oh, um, we're going to raise interest rates again. Stocks will probably go down. If that happens, does that change anything about the company you're looking at? Meaning if you're a startup company, it might. For example, startup companies need financing. Um, they often get bridge loans. Um, they get uh, bonds, they get um, they issue all kinds of ways to finance their business. So if interest rates go up, invest uh, sorry, financing the company will be more expensive. So all of a sudden, if you're investing in the new Amazon and maybe last year's financing costs were below revenue and they were looking good, mm -hmm. if the Fed comes out and says we're going to raise rates, all of a sudden, maybe now they're being pushed over the revenue line, and now their or their financing costs might be higher than their revenue. That would force their hand a little bit. So that's only natural for stock prices to go down. That's why a lot of people believe that long-term assets go down when the Fed raises interest rates. Long-term assets, meaning anything that's a young company. So 
like Apple's not a long term asset in the sense because we know what it does. It's it's not gonna change over overnight. Apple doesn't need financing. Honestly, the Fed has no effect on Apple whatsoever. So that I don't think it applies to companies like that. But if it's like a, a young company and they're trying to come out with a product and they need to finance it, it will affect them deeply because now maybe they're going to have to raise more money. They're going to have to sell more shares and that will dilute you as an investor. The value of what you're paying will go down. So you have to factor that into your model. So um, in a DCF model, a lot of people account for that using the discount rate. So mm -hmm. that would be like a way to like see, okay, yeah, like if if interest rates go up, your discount rate would probably go up as well, which would make stock prices go down. And let's say you had a target price of $250 for Tesla before the Fed came out and raised rates. Then if the Fed comes out and raises, raises rates again, you might have to revise that down a little bit, maybe to 245 to 240 or something like that. But I believe that's the impact that the Fed has in investing in companies, but it really highly depends on which stage the company's in. If, if it's a startup or a young company, it would have more of an impact. The older the company is, the less of an impact it has. Um, only when it comes to certain industries, the impact is more noticeable. For example, finance, obviously, they depend on what the Fed does. So if you're investing in a bank, you really want to be dialed in with the Fed and how that works. Investing in banks is very complicated. So if you do that, I'm assuming you are aware of how banks work and all things like that. But investing in banks have always, has always been very difficult. Um, if you're investing in a car company like GM or Ford, which is a long established company, they've been around for 100 years, that would affect them too because they need a lot of financing costs. They have huge capital requirements. So um, if Ford needs to build a new factory, which costs like $2 billion, maybe if the Fed raises rates, now it's going to cost $2.1 billion. So these things affect long-term assets of all types, meaning capital goods, uh, any kind of service, anything that takes years to play out, the Fed affects. All right. So then people should actually be aware of the interest rates and inflation because they go hand in hand and how they can be able to actually hedge themselves from those price fluctuations and the reports that come from the government institutions. Well, explain. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think like the... The most important thing is not so much the number, meaning the interest rate, but it's the the trend. So if mm -hmm. interest rates are going higher and the expectations are going higher, I believe expectations are sometimes more impactful than the actual number that the Fed reports. So mm -hmm. if people are expecting the Fed to raise, then you should probably expect prices to go down a little bit. If people start to expect the Fed to cut, like now, everybody's expecting the Fed will cut in May or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's why you see the stock market doing well right now, because people are looking out six to nine months into the future. All right, cool, cool. And as we wind up, you can touch on the role of technology um, and machine learning and algorithms when it comes to stocks trading and stocks investing and how people can can make use of you know tech to be able to even do some simple stock screening for themselves be able to actually empower themselves to be able to do their own analysis, pre-market analysis um, by themselves. Um, yeah. yeah like, I mean, I'm a huge user of AI. Like I, I love this new technology. I think it's pretty cool. And um, it doesn't scare me at all. I think once you understand how it works, you know its limitations and you know what it's good for and you know what it's not good for. It's not good for everything. It's not going to solve every problem. But when it comes to investing, when it comes to anything, really, you still have to know your subject. For example, AI makes a lot of mistakes. It tells you, right? You know, like if you go to um, Microsoft Bing or you use ChatGPT or whatever you want to use, the first thing that tells you is this may cause you know false um, um, statements or you might they call it hallucinations. So you have to be aware of that. 
So don't take everything these things tell you as gospel. But if you do your work and you find out, let's just say you're trying to invest in a company and you like the company, you've done a little basic research, you like the product, I suggest you invest in companies that you like. Don't invest in companies you don't like. Um, it would give you more motivation to keep up with what's going on. So uh, if you like the company, you investigated the management a little bit, you maybe read the conference calls, you see like, okay, yeah, like this is looking good and you feel confident that you want to invest in this. If you want to, um, what I do at least, is to use AI to summarize a lot of large documents. So for example, like conference calls, sometimes they can go on for a while. So you can literally copy paste the conference call into, into an AI and ask it to tell you the most important points. So that would be a good way to use it. Another way would be to, I like to use it to assess risk. For example, um, if I have a document from the company and um, let's just say it's an earnings report and I put it in there and I can ask the AI, like, can you please give me the five biggest risk factors for this company's plan not to work or for this company's business model to get broken or something like that. Like you have to be very specific when you ask AI. So um, it will tell you, it will show you like, okay, these are the five things that could go wrong with this plan that the management team has made. So I like to know those things because I always like to know, I'm wired to kind of look at what could go wrong. So um, I like to use AI for that reason. It's like, okay, tell me what risks I'm missing. Tell me what I'm not seeing. Maybe sometimes uh, what I like, what I see a lot is that management teams are very optimistic and they have to be like, you don't want to be a CEO that's always down. You don't want to talk badly about your industry. You want to be upbeat. You want to tell everybody everything is great all the time. I'm not saying CEOs are liars. They're not. They can't. They would be in trouble. But they're sometimes overly optimistic. And I think that when you use AI to parse through those things, it would show you like, oh yeah, like maybe he said in this line that um, maybe manufacturing costs would go up. So that would be a risk that maybe you missed because you were too busy paying attention to all the rosy outcomes that the CEO was talking about. And maybe you missed out on him saying that building a factory is expensive. And, and then you're like, oh yeah, like I got to put that in my model now. So mm -hmm. these are, I think, AI is really good for that kind of thing. Um, I don't recommend you just tell it what stock to buy. <laughs> like if you go and try to, to, you ask it like, give me five stocks to buy. Like, I don't think that's a good idea. Because yeah. um, there's just too much that can go wrong with that. And it's not a financial advisor. It tells you, I think, if you ask it, it would tell you like, oh, I'm not a financial advisor. So, um. But I do think it can help you with your search, with your research. It can help you. Uh, like it used to take me weeks sometimes to to read about a company. Now I can do it all in like four hours. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of what AI is good for. It could mm -hmm. help you condense large documents. It can help you figure out risks. It can help you figure out um, outcomes, positive and negative. And then you can use that to build your model and then figure out whether or not you want to invest in this company or not. So okay. shout out to Ingot for for sponsoring the webinar, Scott, and also for your time. I think we'll have oh, you, you once again for a part two. There's a lot to be discussed on fundamentals and stocks. It's just that time won't allow us. Only had like okay. 40 minutes. Yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's webinar session. We've had an in-depth conversation on the specific individual items that you should look out for if you're looking to trade stocks and these are stocks listed on the new york stock exchange on nasdaq the major indices uh, we've also done an in-depth analysis on fundamentals of a company what you should look out for the healthy um, items that you need to look out for in the financial statements and We'll be looking to onboard you soon uh, if you wish to trade stocks uh, using ingots trading platform you can do so via our link down below